guest is Gemma Whalen, who is a theater director and the founder of the Carib Theater in Portland, Oregon. Welcome. Thank you, Suzanne. So Gemma, I know that you are a art- artistic director, an actress, a director, and also a writer. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started in the theater? Yeah, Uh, I actually started out as an actor, and I had arrived in San Francisco from Ireland after I had studied uh, in Trinity College Dublin. I studied English and French. They didn't have theater departments several decades ago. They only got one in the late 80s, I think, or 90s. Wait, at Trinity College in Ireland? How is that possible? It just isn't. They they didn't exist. It was not a thing, right? Now there's a very famous one, the Beckett Center at Trinity, and all over. They all have theater programs. It wasn't considered worthy of academic study, so it didn't exist in departments. But there was, you know, there was a very strong live theater tradition, of course, in Ireland, an apprenticeship, and that was considered the way, but nobody thought that it was something to be studied. Um, So I came to, I was in San Francisco, and I started taking acting lessons at American Conservatory Theater, ACT, and just sort of fell in love. And at the same time, there was an Irish theater company in San Francisco called the Irish Players, and I was very shy. So I thought, I'm in a brand new country and a city, and nobody knows me, so it doesn't really matter, so I'll just audition. And I ended up getting cast in, there were actually two plays by John Millington Singh. Um, Yes, who wrote, who was well known for Playboy of the Western World, but these were um, shorter plays, two one-act plays by him. And then after that, I just, I realized this was it. This was what I loved, because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And then I applied to UC Berkeley, and um, a graduate program in directing. So I was doing some acting, and then I also did some assistant directing and realized I really liked directing also. Were there very many women directors at this time? No. There were none that I knew of, actually. So there weren't really any role models. And um, and I, I entered um, a graduate program at Berkeley, and I there were 10. They... They took in 10 people each year, and then by year two, they were down to five. That's They had a 50% attrition rate. Why and is that? It was on purpose. I They were the number of slots, I guess, they decided. Interesting. I don't know. And I was the only woman. There were 10, nine men, and I was the only woman. And I ended up actually, it was really intense, and I ended up dropping out. No, I didn't drop out, but I left at the end of the first year. And then I, you know, in that year, I worked in San Francisco. I did, there were all sorts of adventures. I almost went to Libya. Yeah, I got a job over there teaching English and had my passport translated into Arabic by Gaddafi. And it was, it was a very actually stupid, dangerous thing that I luckily figured out, don't do it. And um, so then I went back to Berkeley a year later. They accepted me back and I was uh, one of five women. And it actually was a completely different experience. And I well, loved Wait, it. what changed in a year that allowed there to be five women where before you that were That was the, the next one? year. It was just happened to be the 50% that carried on from that year. They were in year two. We were all in year two, right? So they had done year one the year that I had taken off. And my other group, but, you know, in the group of, of the class I was in was a perfectly nice group of, of, of men, even young men. Um, it just, I think it might have been the intensity for me and also the difference in the way people talked. I wasn't used to talking up. And that's talking up, speaking up. Uh, in Ireland, that wasn't part of, it just wasn't part of the tradition, right? So suddenly I'm in this group of very, um, I would say, assertive men. And I had to try and learn to keep up. And then I, I did, but it was so exhausting. I think I had to take a, while, a time off. I didn't know I was taking time off. I didn't know I was coming back. But then I missed theater so much and realized I really wanted to make it my profession. So, um, yeah, so I ended up um, studying there. And while I was still there, I started directing in the community. And I started creating my own classes in improvisational theater and teaching acting. 
And I was also teaching as part of my sort of program, a sort of the funding that they gave me, they, I had teaching. So I was teaching my own acting classes at UC Berkeley as well. Many of the graduate students did that. Why did you want to do acting in communities as well as be part of the graduate program? I well, mean, you it, did that on your own, right? It, it, well, it was yeah in B- Berkeley. Um, there was a company in Berkeley, and they advertised for directors. And I thought I can apply for this, and um, I just wanted more experience, you know. And outside of campus, I was anxious to get more experience. And um, it was actually that was like the first job that I got. Um, this was in the mid eighties, and it was there was a whole panel that actually interviewed me for this directing job. The board of directors of the company interviewed me, and this was a very small, a smallish theater. And um, so, I, yeah, I basically just wanted to expand, and that was it. And it seems at the same time that you are studying theater, you you've also immigrated from Ireland, yes. so you are kind of a new yeah. um, citizen, or I, I don't know if you were a citizen at the time, but but I imagine that also had um, some element of uh, cultural shock to it, to, to, you know, to be in this new context culturally as yes. well as professionally. It did. Yeah, it was all it was all very new and very different. Um, and people probably think it's very similar, you know, and probably Ireland today is more similar than the States in some ways, because a lot of time is, you know, the decades have intervened. And um, but Ireland, even until like 15, 20 years ago, was um, I would say it was in the past. I mean, it was the traditions were very different. And um, and then Ireland has this ability to take momentous leaps forward. So now it might be ahead. And in fact, I think actually socially, and it's much more progressive than many places in this country and in Europe. That would have been unthinkable 20 years ago or, you know, 30 years ago, let's say. Um, so, yeah, but it was a bit of a culture shock. And that uh, I think even that what I described as my first year at UC Berkeley and figuring out how to speak up for myself and um, that, you know, I had to be heard and didn't know how to do that, really, and was sort of in competition. I mean, it's and again, I, w- I want to stress that my my my, you know, classmates were like really nice guys and, and they were my friends, too. But, um, yeah, I think it was it was a culture shock. It was. And it's interesting that now you have founded a theater which produces contemporary Irish plays. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the founding of the Carb Theater? Yeah. Um, I, I do want to say that for years I avoided anything to do with Irish plays. I didn't direct. I did direct Beckett, but I, I you know, I don't really consider Beckett. I, he's totally Irish and also not Irish, you know, because he's so, he's just a, a, such a unique voice and very universal, I think. Um, well, and, you know, European. I mean, he lived in France really for most of his life. Um, so I, I didn't want to be branded as an Irish director. So I just avoided Irish plays. Um, this was after my stint of acting, you know, in that first Irish theater company. But when I, when I moved to Portland, um, I started, uh, really small, just with doing a reading actually. And, um, Portland is very different from the Bay Area, which has a big Irish, Irish American community. But here there's a much smaller community. There are people here from Ireland and they're Irish Americans, but not com- nothing compared to the Bay Area or Los Angeles or Boston, obviously, or New York. So I wasn't sure that there would be an interest. Not that I wanted to appeal to Irish people, but I didn't know if Irish subject matter or Irish plays. So I ended up doing a play called Night in November, which was a one-man show set in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. And it's it's very funny and also very sort of crazy serious at the same time. And um, it ended up being really popular. People loved it. It was complicated in terms of the politics and because Northern Ireland is complicated in terms of politics. And um, people really got it, really understood and wanted to know more. So that was really how it started. And I, you know, did it show by show and then realized there's an audience here. Um, like our first show, we decided we would do it for eight performances. And then we renewed twice. I think we just added more performances and kept adding more performances. 
Um, and we started out at Kells Irish Pub. They graciously gave us the use of their banquet room upstairs. And um, eventually we outgrew it because we started doing, you know, bigger shows. And um, we had to perform Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights because it was very loud at the weekends because it's a pub. And that's their primary business, right? So, um, yeah, so it's now, th- that was 2012 was the first reading. And so we're in our seventh year. And now, for quite a while now, we've been doing full seasons and, um, and then a theater tour to Ireland every summer. So when I look at the, the season, you have a really interesting mix of, of plays. Um, and, and I'm just wondering how you decide what plays to produce during a season. Yeah, uh, I read a lot of really fascinating plays. Our focus at Carib is on contemporary Irish plays. And, um, and then I keep a special eye out for plays by women or underrepresented voices and have from the beginning. Um, and how and do you find these voices? Um, I... Yeah, I look at what's going on in some of the smaller theatres. Well, bigger theatres too in Dublin, so I'm on their mailing list. And um, even the Abbey Theatre or the Peacock, which is their experimental wing, um, Project Arts Centre, Fishamble Theatre, some of the theatres. And then I have, um, in addition to our board at CARB, we have a resource council. And one of the people on my resource council lives in Ireland, and she's at University College Galway, NUIG, the National University. And she's a theater practitioner. And she, um, actually, she and a colleague of mine from California um, co wrote, co edited a book called Staging Intercultural Ireland a few years ago. And um, a lot of the plays I'm doing now, some of the plays now, I've done them, and I'm, next year I'm looking at some plays from that volume. They looked at the new face of Ireland, you know, from. There has been a big influx of immigrants, asylum seekers, refugees. Ireland has, in the in the last, I would say from the late 90s on especially, there was a huge shift. So there's, um, I, I read those plays. So it's a combination of reading. People now know about us more, so people actually send me scripts. and Or I'll read a play by a playwright, and uh, then I'll write to that playwright or contact them or contact the company and ask, either if it's that play I want I'll I'll order the play or else if there are other plays by them so you know so it sort of grows and then I have uh, my sister one of my sisters lives in Dublin my family still mostly lives in Ireland and my sister's a big theatre goer so she'll she'll let me know Um, yeah or I'll see things you know that are at the Edinburgh Fringe and think that sounds interesting look it up and then see if it's suitable for CARB it's an interesting thing to produce contemporary Irish plays in Portland, Oregon. How do you think that contemporary Irish plays and concerns speak to the concerns of, mm-hmm. of people locally here? Yeah, I actually think there's a huge connection um, between what's going on in Ireland, both both the history of Ireland in the past and what's going on right now. Um, and connections between what's going on in this country. Um, So, for example, um, well, this year, for example, this season, I'm doing, I I, I call it, uh, basically I'm looking back, I'm calling it Remembrance, Resistance, and Restitution, which is what I call the season. And for Remembrance, I'm looking back at some of the I would say atrocities that have happened in Ireland, the way people have been treated in the recent past. So in this case, it's, you know, the 20th century. And the first play was about the Magdalene Laundries, where women were basically incarcerated and made to work with slave labor, uh, for their ho- sometimes for their whole lives, for the sin of getting pregnant and not being married. And sometimes they actually had not even gotten pregnant. Sometimes they were considered an occasion of sin because they were too pretty or they'd been caught flirting. So, oh yes. Um, and some of them actually literally, especially the women who had babies, the babies were taken away from them and they often spent their whole lives there. Supposedly, they were called penitents, this was how they were supposed to get to heaven, to make up for the sin, this sin. 
And this, of course, did not take, not that it's a sin anyway, and obviously I don't believe it was a sin, but there were also cases of rape, incest. Um, it was often, you know, employers, um, priests, so the religious institutions. Um, so, and often these girls, and, you know, in some of it was a case of there was not education in terms of birth control or and definitely sexuality was never spoken about. So, um, and then this, the next play that I'm doing, James X, we did Eclipsed in the Fall. It's a similar story by a man who, as a child, went through industrial schools, reform schools, and so on. So um, these were institutions that actually the Irish, as, as you know, you know, the history of Ireland is that it was colonized, right? So there's that history of colonization by the British. And uh, and there are many plays. I, I um, One of the plays I did a couple of years ago was uh, Belfast Girls, and it was set during the Irish famine. And um, but it it was how women it, it dealt with women's lives during the Irish famine, which is something you don't hear about much. And it was girls who were probably they were undesirable, so-called undesirable young women. Um, and they were sent on so-called orphan boats to Australia, to the colonies, to supposedly become wives of farmers there, a better life for them. But And it, what made them undesirable or defined as um, undesirable? Some of, them were, um, some of them were prostitutes, some of them worked the streets, which actually was very, very common during the famine. Families broke up completely. A lot of men left. So the social st- fabric um, was torn apart. So sometimes that was the only way that women could actually survive. Um, so they may or may not have been, you know, working the streets, um, or they had a reputation that was not, you know, morally morally upright. Let's say. Um, so the country wanted to get rid of them. They, the government wanted to get rid of them. So it, it was only found out afterwards there was actually a scheme to get rid of these women. And, uh, and none of, they were supposed to be 18-year-old orphans. Well, very few of them were orphans and very few of them were 18. So, yeah, it's just, uh, it's one of those stories. I actually didn't know about the story till I read the play, Belfast Girls. Um, so, so I would say, um, but then, then Ireland got its independence in 1922. And the stories, the last two that I just mentioned, Eclipsed and James X., that happened since Ireland was ruling itself. Like suddenly we are now the ones who are, you know, have control. We have freedom, so to speak. And the people at the top, the church and the state, uh, they had an idea of the type of Ireland that they wanted to portray to people. And that was Catholic. Um, their version of morality, mor- morality or ethics, and, uh, you know, Snow White, women were the keepers, of course, and they were the ones who were supposed to act in a certain way. So anything that was outside of that so-called norm or the norm that they had set, they pushed away. It was a big, it was a, a secret, a huge secret. Um, so, you know, we have a similar history in this country uh, in terms of the foundation, how it was founded. It was founded by trampling on other people, right? Yep. We do have a history of our, Ireland. Our lands were taken away from us. Um, and, uh, and there's just, you know, there's a history of, I mean, today, you know, how we treat children, um, um, how we treat immigrants, how we treat the so-called other or anybody who, um, James X is also very much about class. And, um, certainly in the past, I think the way that people in the so-called lower classes or working classes were treated uh, would probably be very very higher higher level of incarceration. They got in trouble with the law. They were most children were more likely to come from big families and be out on the streets or missing school, and then they would be taken away or get involved in petty crime and then get locked up for it. Whereas um, I'm pretty sure that if a rich kid stole you know a dinky toy or a box of biscuits as the character in James X did, they would not have been sent to an industrial school. And an industrial school was an institution. It was locked up. It was like a prison. And uh, they were run by the um, religious, by the Christian brothers. And in subsequent years, it was discovered there was horrendous physical, emotional, sexual abuse of the children. It was rampant. 
Can you talk about the last play? Yeah, we have some happy plays too in (laughs) Ireland. So in case you think, and you know, I say this actually really with the perspective that I said it at the beginning is that I think Ireland actually today, probably not that it's perfect, but um, it is um, possibly one of the most progressive places in Europe. You know, several years ago, Ireland was the first country to vote for marriage equality by popular vote. Um, a How year- has that come about, given, you know, what what yeah. in the past was kind of a very conservative yeah. um, populace? I think it has to do with all of these secrets eventually, as they will, as secrets will, they come out. Uh, you can't keep them down forever. People are eventually are going to, you know, speak up. And women started speaking up. And... Um, I think they just, you know, demanded answers. And um, basically, they're they're literally finding the bodies. They're still literally finding bodies today. I mean, um, you, you probably know about the, the mother baby homes where they just found 796 or something bodies of babies buried in a sewer. So... You know, this is this is happening today. They're actually being exhumed right now. They're they're passing laws to make it possible for them to be exhumed and the remains to be buried with some dignity and identified. Uh, actually, they have identified the babies. They've identified them and they named them. They published those almost eight hundred names. Um, so, they um, because it's coming out, the people who are responsible, they're trying to hold them accountable. There are reparations being made, for example, to the Magdalene Laundry. There's other, I won't go into all, other, all of the atrocities because there are too many. But I think the good side is that people are demanding answers. They're demanding that people step up. Um, there are public apologies that are happening. There are monuments. There are, you know, there are, there is help. Their support. Um, it doesn't make up for what happened in the past, but at least it's something. And um, and also there's a whole new group of, you know, I mentioned immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and something like 18% of the population of Ireland today is born outside of Ireland. So it's a whole new perspective. It opened up to Europe in the late 90s with the European Union, now the EC. And um, so... It was Ireland was very insular before that. It obviously is an island, but it it was insular in the, both literal and literally and metaphorically. Now it's not now because it's so connected to Europe. Um, it's much more progressive. Um, you know, it passed the um, there was a very restrictive um, abortion. Um, amendment in Ireland, which was appealed, repealed um, about a year and a half ago. So um, Ireland has the lowest birth rate in Europe and has had for actually for about two decades now. So this is from going from having eight to 10 children, you know. Um, Yeah. And, you know, women don't put up with what they used to put up with. They speak up. Um, we've had, you know, I think somebody like Mary McAleese was the president of Ireland, and she's like an amazing international figure. She changed the presidency, made it very active. So there have been women leaders and, um, you know, enlightened. Our current president is gay, openly gay, married, and um, he's Indian. He's Irish Indian. So, Right. Big change. Yeah, that is a big change. Lots of changes, lots of changes. So, um, yeah, so all that to say, you asked me about the last play. And so so I just want to say, I don't want to paint Ireland in, you know, as the, it's it's all negative um, because I think people are actually um, trying to, and changes are being made. And and I I do think when things happen in Ireland, it tends to be seismic. It's like now there are these massive shifts that are happening. Kissing the Witch, which is the last play of the season, it's by Emma Donahue, who is most famous, I think, for Room, her novel, um, which was also made into a movie. Um, she's Irish, living in Canada now with her wife and family. Um, she writes a lot about gay issues, um, women's issues, um, women's freedom, and so on. And um, yeah, Room was the um, the play, and it was based on a true story. Sorry, the novel based on a true story of this young boy who is has his mother has been taken hostage, um, and is basically a sex slave to this man who lives in the main house and keeps her locked in a shed with the and the boy is born there through, because of rape. So she, it's a brilliant book. 
it's really, really, really brilliant. It starts out, it, it is made up language in the book because that's how she, te- and she teaches him how to write. Um, so I heard of Emma Donahue first actually in the 90, maybe the mid 90s. I saw a play by her, it's called Ladies and Gentlemen. And it was about women who passed as men. Um, so she writes a lot of historical um, fiction as well, but often based on true, based on actual historical women. And I remember thinking that I really love that play. I'd love to read it again. And then I wonder, has she written any other plays? Because I knew about Room. And then I um, ordered a collection of her plays and I read Kissing the Witch. And that was based on, she had written a series of 13 um, fairy tales, basically a subversion of um, the European, many of the well-known European fair, fairy tales like Beauty and the Beast. And she really skews them and rewrites them from a feminist point of view. And um, in her play, she took, I believe it's four of those plays, original, and four of those pieces, made them into plays, wrote another one herself, I mean, a separate one, not based on, you know, another source, and then wove them all together in this really interesting way. And the play is written for three women in different stages of their lives, 20s, 40s, 60s, and one man. And they all play multiple roles. And each of them, and each of the women in turn, is a witch. But, in, you know, a, a very, very powerful witch in a non-traditional way. So I felt that that was, you know, ha- I have two plays, which I, we, we have a strong emphasis on social justice plays at Carib. And um, I really wanted to end the season on, it's funny, so it's a comedy, but it really has a serious intent as well. Um, you know, it starts with a quote, um, something like a boy, when boy has an adventure, when a boy goes on a journey, it's called an adventure. And when a girl goes on a journey, it's only a fairy tale. And she turns that whole thing upside down and really plays with the conventions. And it's a lot of fun. And it's a sort of a tour de force for the actors as well. They really get to have fun switching roles, playing all these different roles and um, and it's very empowering. You obviously feel very passionate about theater, and you have done a lot of work, and a lot of the theater, it seems, is connected to social justice. How do you think that theater helps us to create a more just society? I want to believe that it does. I I mean, I do believe passionately in the power of theater. I think there's something so powerful, and even more so in this day and age, when with electronics and we all have our devices and people spend so much time in front of screens that people leave their home. You actually leave your home and you go to another place, to a theater, where usually the lights are turned down in the audience. They don't have to be. But um, And then you are in the presence of other actors in real time, um, people who are enacting a story. And um, there's something just that, just that I think that, that is almost um, a, an act of courage these days. I mean, it's so, it, it's unusual. It's almost subversive to keep going to theater, right? When you could sit home and you could stream whatever you like and in the comfort of your own living room. So... Um, so I, I think there's something about that human connection and um, there's something ancient about it as well and something primal is, you know, we started out by telling stories to each other. Um, we made sense of our lives by telling stories and I think we still make sense of our lives by telling stories. And um, we need to hear them. We need to see ourselves reflected back. We need to see stories of other people who we may or may not encounter in our own lives and realize, see, see what it's like to, um, you know, actors get to step inside their shoes and experience from the inside. And I think theater is visceral in that sense. And it can have an impact that, and I, I, I love film um, also and, and, and I love and fiction 
But there's something very special about the live aspect of theater. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Suzanne. So I've been talking today with Gemma Whalen, who is a director, writer, and the founding artistic director of the Carob Theater in Portland, Oregon.